Good evening. All right, thank you. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first spring semester event in the, fac in the series Faculty in Focus. My name is Drew Thompson, and I am an associate professor of visual culture and black studies here at the Bard Graduate Center. I have the unique opportunity of welcoming you this evening and introducing our distinguished guest, Simone Brown, an American artist. Simone Brown is an award-winning author of the book, Dark Matters on Surveillance and Blackness, published by Duke University Press in 2015. She is currently at work on a book provisionally titled Black Artists and the Disruption of Surveillance. Brown serves as Associate Professor of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas, Austin, where she teaches and researches in the areas of surveillance studies, digital media, and Black studies. Amongst many other honors, she is the 2023-2024 recipient of the Arts Writers Grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation and is co-editor of the book series, Erin Trees, okay, at Duke University Press. American Artist is a practicing artist and lecturer in the sculpture department at the Yale School of Design. Their multimedia and immersive um, works broadly explore questions of policing, technology, anti-Blackness, and race. They are the recipient of numerous awards and grants from Creative Capital, United States Artists, and the Los Angeles County Museum. American Artists has exhibited widely at institutions like the Whitney Museum of Art, MoMA, PS1, Studio Museum in Harlem, and, and the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, Chicago. A word about tonight's event. We have asked both Simone and American artists to provide seven minute presentations around the keyword theme of surveillance. After their presentations, I will moderate a conversation um, between our two guests. Then we will take questions. Before turning it over to our speakers, I wanted to provide some context for this faculty and focus on Polaroids as black material culture specifically with regards to the questions that I'm interested in exploring with our invited guests here tonight and who will cover and topics that we will cover throughout the semester in events that will follow. Polaroid cameras and films revolutionized how black populations in the United States and in Africa pictured and viewed themselves. However, little is known about the history of Polaroids in Africa and the diaspora. Consider that the Polaroid Corporation provided it prided itself on employing African Americans, and that it inserted itself in the affairs of the African continent while seeking profits by marketing to Black consumers in the United States. Polaroids appear scarce in Southern Africa, where um, Polaroid widely advertised its products. In 1971, and you can see the advertisement to your right, Black workers at the Polaroid Corporation discovered the company's business activities in South Africa, which involved selling camera technology that allowed the apartheid South African government to issue passbooks and in turn separate populations according to race. In response to the company's business dealings, black workers under the leadership of Caroline Hunter and Ken Williams organized the Polaroid Revolutionary Workers Movement the first anti-apartheid boycott movement of its kind in the United States, and one that centered around photography. The Polaroid Revolutionary Workers Movement gained an audience at the United Nations in front of its anti-apartheid committee and drew the Polaroid Corporation into a six-year public relations crisis over its business activity further drawing attention to how instant colored photography and photography companies profited from state surveillance. The Polaroid Revolutionary Workers Movement is largely understood through the framing of the anti-apartheid boycott movement. Little is known about the workers who staffed and joined the organization along with the group's day-to-day -day activities. Ultimately, in 1977, the Polaroid Corporation ceased its business in South Africa. The same year, there is evidence of increasing use of Polaroids in U.S. prisons, such as the project here by Jack Reuters Booth, who uses Polaroid cameras and films to create the Women Prisoners series. Reuters, 
Booth visited a prison facility not too far away from the Polaroids um, Corporation's Cambridge headquarters and used Polaroids to photograph the facility's inhabitants and to teach them incarcerated populations how to use photography. It is important to note that incarcerated populations that I have taught explain that Polaroids are some of the only images they were in possession of. And for these reasons, you often see Polaroids at the funerals of their, um, their former inmates um, when they die. Also, Polaroids can be a constant feature of family visits in prisons and is quite possibly prisoner labor that allows inmates to purchase their image and that of their loved ones. Use of Polaroids in contemporary art practice and the history of photography often concentrate on Robert, Robert Maplethorpe, Angela Adams, Andy Warhol, and Chuck Close, to name a few photographers. However, over the course of the 1980s, Black artists like Lorna Simpson and Dawood Bey offered mesmerizing and thought-provoking social and political critiques through their individual use of Polaroids to image Black life. By proxy, because of museum attempts to exhibit more Black artists and to be more inclusive of Black art, their images became wrapped up in societal debates over multiculturalism, a prelude to more recent art historical and art institutional debates on inclusion, reparations, and the provenance of African and Indigenous art. More recently, contemporary photographers like Chun Li or Mohamed Borisa displayed here, and Naima Green interrogate the archiving and surveillance capacities of Polaroids, and in the process highlight the role of colored photography in photography's technological development. This faculty and focus would will touch on themes of technology, surveillance and incarceration, and labor and activism. A larger question at hand is what does it mean to consider material culture through the lens of blackness? A starting point is interrogating what it means to think of Polaroids as objects of black material culture. I hope the overarching aim will be to explore possible frameworks that place the arts and material culture of Africa and the black diaspora into greater conversation with African American art history and history. So without further delay, please let us join me in welcoming Simone Brown to the podium to speak. Thank you. It's so great to see you all here today, or this evening. A quick look at the archives of Digitized Jet and Ebony magazines. One can find ads throughout the years for new Polaroid cameras. Some of these ads encourage readers to enter their, um, their pictures into photo contests. Others, like the ones here, um, let Jet and Ebony readers know that a Polaroid is for making Christmas ornaments and lists and for indexing personal property for insurance claim purposes. And while these ads might be instructive or prescriptive, as Drew Thompson's research has taught us, Polaroid as technology and as black material culture has and continues to be a site for creative and capacious renderings of black social life forms. From the annotations written on the print's borders to the rules and regulations banning Polaroids from sites of incarceration, the threat perhaps being that they could be used to smuggle contraband between its layered film and paper. Instant, portable, quick, and unforgiving, the Polaroid is seemingly has protocols that one must follow. I remember more than once blowing on them or waving it in an effort to make the glossy image develop more quickly and being told to leave it alone and don't disturb its groove. Those haptics and gestures, I knew someone would get that. <laughs> Those haptics and gestures to me seem part of the sensation and its magic. Last year, I had the opportunity to curate an exhibition, Not Only, Not Only Will I Steer. This exhibition's title is Bored from the Line in the Essay, The Oppositional Gaze by late poet, professor, and black feminist writer, Bell Hooks, from her 1992 book, Black Looks, Race and Representation. In this essay, Hooks examines the role of Black spectatorship, the violent ways in which Black people are denied the right to look, the meaningfulness of counter-memory, and the critical practice of Black women's rebellious gazing as a way to know the present and invent the future. 
So when it comes to troubling surveillance and its various methodologies, the five artists whose work was featured in this exhibition, American artists, Camila Janan Reed, Ricky Weaver, Sable Lee Smith, and Sadie Barnett, explore strategies of invention, disruption, refusal, and care. Whether through sculpture, etched plexiglass, Xerox-based collage, archival portraiture, video, or powdered graphic drawings, their works in this exhibition distill the productive possibilities of creative innovation and imagining Black life beyond the surveillance state. Oh, sorry. The exhibition's title um, was also borrowed from Wiki Weaver's Amazing Grace, an archival print, a pigment print, a bell hooks co quotation etched in black plexi plexiglass. It is a hymn as sonic collaboration. Amazing Grace represents the beginning of Weaver's practice of placing the titles of her work in quotation marks, indicating citation and collective engagement. Weaver's Amazing Grace is a study of matriarchal lineage, magic, and grief. The priest conjures, as she puts it, portals to worlds that don't require escape. On one panel of this diptych is a digital photograph of Weaver's 103-year-old grandmother, Audrey L. Weaver, um, at her home in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Taken with a Mamiya Leaf Credo digital camera, uh, Mrs. Weaver sits with her hands folded and resting on her dining room table and stares right into the camera. Mrs. Audrey Weaver's expression reveals that while Black looks can be oppositional, interrogative, and instructive, they also are ones of care and communion. Weaver describes her process as a means to, quote, reimagine the language of Black women's gestures as a portal to otherwise. The reflective surface of the Black plexiglass inspires con contemplation of portals, mirrors, and windows to elsewhere, while inviting the viewer to reflect, the, the viewer's reflected image to commune with Weaver's archive. Mugshot is a reclamation and part of Oakland-based artist Sadie Barnett's FBI drawings. By way of a Freedom of Information Act request that took close to five years to process, Barnett's family secured a dossier of around 500 pages that the FBI compiled through its years-long surveillance of her father, Rodney Barnett. In the late 1960s, Rodney Barnett co-founded the Compton, California chapter of the Black Panther Party, and he later organized with the National United Committee to free Angela Davis. The declassified files on Rodney Barnett provides evidence of the FBI's violent campaigns of threats, intimidation, and disinformation. The violence was at once bureaucratic, teletype memos, um, rubber stamp confidential, and opaque blocks that concealed redacted information. It was also intimate. FBI agents paid visits to Rodney Barnett's families, neighbors, places of employment, and even his high school teachers in Medford, Massachusetts. He was eventually fired from his job with the U.S. Postal Service under the orders of the FBI. Barnett has explained her method as spellcasting for repair and justice. And for this work, she first created large machine cut stencils from the pages of the dossier, then used them to hand brush powdered graphite pigment to the underlying white service, surface. This is time intensive process of layering graphite represents a ritual act of care and mourning that, as she put it, totally inverts the dossier's pages. Barnett recontextualized the bureaucratic acts of redaction by overlaying the FBI dossier's director's J. F. R. Hoover's signature with a bar of, of purple spray paint. And she annotates the files with drawings of roses, bows, and a daughter's Helly Hello Kitty People's Army. These hand-drawn portraits rendered from, uh, this one particular here, mugshot, um, is rendered from the only photographic image uh, found in the 500-page declassified file, a police photograph of Rodney Barnett. In this way, Barner's, Barnett's drawings repair and reframe the rug, mugshot, redacted memos, concealed reports, and other records of the FBI's targeting of her father as an internal threat to national security. In Tina Camp's Listening to Images, she proposes a haptic mode of engaging the sonic frequencies of the photograph. To listen to images is a method for Camp that begins with reckoning with the unspoken relations that structure the images considera under consideration. She writes, 
I do so by setting them in, in a kind of sensorial relief that juxtaposes the sonic, haptic, historical, and effective backgrounds and foregrounds through and against which we view photographs. American artist Blue Life Seminar is the sonic background and foreground to this exhibition. It's a soundtrack. Rather than being an instructional video, Blue Life Seminar is a CGI and audio rendering that blends the story of Christopher Dorner with the blue-skinned Dr. Manhattan of DC Comics. Dorner was a former LAPD officer and naval reservist who in 2013 killed four people, including three cops. After a days-long manhunt, Dorner died in a standoff at a cabin near uh, Big Bear um, Lake, California, during which the police used an armored tractor and pyrotechnic tear gas. Prior to the shootings, Dorner posted an 11,000-word manifesto online, and in it he distails his dis disillusionment with the LAPD, his motivations for the killings, and his belief that he was terminated by the LAPD in racist retaliation for reporting police abuse and misconduct. He said, I had broken their supposed blue line. American artists composed Blue Life Seminar script by merging direct quotations from Dorner's manifesto with a language that is meant to sound like something Dr. Manhattan would say about Blue Life. Taken together, American artists I'm Blue and Blue Life Seminar interrogate the methods and mythologies of policing. The symbolic power of police theatrics like the thin blue line, the blue wall of silence, and reactionary blue, live matter, blue lives matter bills, flags, memes, and other things. These are uh, indicated in, in artist police training seminar, which is what the sculpture is here. Upholstered with blue, with blue police uniform fabric, a tactical shield like the kind deployed by police in times of uprising and suppression, it fortifies the classroom desk and while also obstructing Blue Life Seminar's flat screen monitor. Um, one thing with this is that throughout, and it was very specific in how um, artists uh, make, makes, requires that we um, uh, two things. The books had specific placements. There were specific books that had to be used, which I, which is something I learned throughout this. And the sound was always on, uh, never turned down throughout the entire um, exhibition. And so this kind of intentionality, I think, is very important in artist work. In 2013, American artists legally changed their name to American artists and in so doing, reframe the very definition of who is an American artist. And so I'd like you to join me in welcoming American today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Um, and thank you, Drew, for inviting me to participate in this. Um, and yeah, I wanted to just start off by saying how much Simone's work has influenced me. I think almost almost every class I've taught with a significant amount of reading has some, some part of dark matters in it. Um, so it's something that I've thought very deeply about over the last several years and has certainly influenced my work and um, some of, or yeah some of the work I'll talk about today sort of directly um, draws from Simone's work um, and I also want to say I I'm not I'm not so well versed in the history of Polaroids per se but I think for me it's an interesting jumping off point to think about technologies of um, capture and also the agency that can be held and who is sort of behind the camera, who is doing the capturing and what that means specifically for black people um, to be behind a camera. And so something that I'm thinking about in these works that I'm going to show you is these sort of like technologies of surveillance, technologies of watching, technology of capture, um, and how those can be subverted or ways in which they can be undermined. Between looking and being looked at, spectacle and spectatorship, enjoyment and being enjoyed, lies and moves the economy of what Sadia Hartman calls hypervisibility. And this is a quote from Fred Moten.
And so this quote sort of leads me um, to think about what I was just describing about sort of the agency that one may have in sort of wielding a technology um, and deciding how and when and where um, they might encounter that form of capture. And something that I have thought about a lot is Simone's notion of dark surveillance. And so I'm gonna sort of try and recount um, this one concept a little bit. So there's a diagram that is in her book, Dark Matters, and this is created by um, Steve Mann, who's a surveillance studies um, academic. And in this diagram, he's attempting to show that there are different forms of valence and Valence, you know, not surveillance, but just that last part, valence is a sort of neutral form of watching. So something watching something. Um, and then surveillance being the case in which a entity in power is sort of watching one not in power. So there's a power dynamic that's implied when you have surveillance. Um, and then he describes surveillance, um, which is the opposite of that. So that's someone not in power observing that in power. And a sort of example that I think might come to mind is like um, people filming the cops. So ways in which, or like citizen surveillance, so ways in which people kind of undermine um, these state actors of power um, by choosing to observe them. Um, and this diagram, it has two dimensions. Um, I'm not gonna to get too deep into it. I mean, even now it's taken me a long time to wrap my head around this, but I'll say that there's there's many ways that different amounts of either having surveillance or not having surveillance, having surveillance or not having surveillance can all sort of add up to a different type of valence. That's kind of the idea um, behind this diagram. And, So thinking about these sort of like, um, well, for one thing, the Cartesian grid aspect of how Steve Mann is thinking about surveillance, I think already is kind of built into this logic framework of capture, you know, like the Cartesian grid is used to map something. It's sort of part of this scientific um, legacy of trying to like dimensionally coordinate, like where is something? And to me, that is still sort of embedded in this notion of capture. Um, and this is a photograph. It's, it's just a photo I came across from 1940. And this is from the Ann Arbor Police Department and they're constructing a police radio tower. And I was just interested in uh, police towers in general as sort of a surveillance mechanism, but also thinking about this frame that they're building out um, and how that frame sort of like reminds me of this notion of like a gridded form of capturing. And also the fact that they're building something that could be used to watch. So this is Simone describing Steve Mann's valence plane. Using this model, but imagining Mann's valence plane as operating in three dimensions, I plot dark surveillance as an imaginative place from which to mobilize a critique of racializing surveillance a critique that takes form in anti-surveillance, counter-surveillance, and other freedom practices. So what is dark surveillance? So this is Simone's, um, Simone's introduction of this concept of dark surveillance, which is sort of pointing out the fact that in Steve Mann's logic of surveillance, there's this missing aspect of racialization that um, shifts how surveillance operates, you know, so it sort of adds a third dimension that's not accounted for in the way that he's attempting to map it. And dark surveillance um, is something that could be used to describe ways in which enslaved African peoples were sort of undermining um, attempts to keep them captive, so ways that they um, were able to Escape, escape slavery, different things such as Negro spirituals that would, you know, inform other enslaved peoples on a path to freedom, as well as 
pranks on slave patrollers, so things that directly undermined those that were trying to enforce capture. Um, also something like Harriet Jacobs' loophole of retreat, I would think of as a sort of means of undermining um, captivity during enslavement. So sort of becoming kind of obsessed with this grid and thinking about, okay, like, where is this third dimension? Where does dark surveillance exist on this grid? If we were to sort of like imagine that, um, I, I created this object and this piece is called valence caliper and um, parentheses annotated. And so the center part of it, the sort of black part is this, what appears to be a device that would be used to measure these first two dimensions of um, valence. And then there's this exterior part that's sort of, you know, cursorily built onto it. That's an attempt to sort of locate where's this other um, third dimension and where it might dark surveillance take place. And so this black object, as I mentioned, this would be the device that's trying to map these two dimensions. Um, and then the wood that's built out of it is someone trying to figure out where's this third dimension and what is missing. And so this French text translates to valence caliber, so an object that's used to measure the valence. Um, and this is kind of a close-up of the middle portion where you see the grid that's meant to measure. And the, the annotations that are on this wood structure are sort of thinking about what are the different um, qualities that are leading to this concept of dark surveillance in order to find out like where is it located and also what other types of valence might exist um, if there were a third dimension to this. So on the bottom you have like anti-surveillance, um, And this is sort of like where ultimately we presume dark surveillance may be located. Um, and next to that, it says tactics employed to remain out of sight, I believe. Black lives are still imperiled and devalued by a racial calculus and a political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago. This is the afterlife of slavery skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment. I too am the afterlife of slavery. This is Sadia Hartman again. And I think about this a lot also in the context of Christina Sharp's notion of the wake, um, which is very much related to this idea of like the afterlife of slavery or sort of what are the remaining conditions societal conditions that sort of reproduce this logic of capture um, and enslavement that is a racialized practice. So how does that still show up, you know, in daily life? And this is something that was important for me in thinking about um, the current state of policing and also the future of policing. And I worked on this project that was specifically thinking about predictive policing technology. Um, and so this this exhibition that I'm going to show you was sort of thinking about that. And it was called My Blue Window. And that title in particular was thinking about um, the windshield of the police cruiser as sort of my blue window having this kind of possessive tone to it. Like this is the sort of perspective through which the police um, looks through and sort of makes judgment calls on what they're seeing. And also thinking of it as having this kind of predatory framework through which they're looking. Um, and so when you walk into the installation, you're confronted with this deep blue curtain and then sort of walk around it to enter into the installation. And then you would sit on these bleachers. Um, so it has this kind of voyeuristic quality to it through which you're watching this dash cam footage. And I'm going to show you a clip of the video. But before that, I'll just say um, this is 
this is sort of a depiction of predictive policing that's meant to kind of like point out how it sound it seems like something that's of the future or something that's you know out of a sci-fi novel um but it this film is set in the past and it's set around the time when this technology began to be in use to sort of point out this discrepancy between how we imagine um these things unfolding between when they actually go into use um and the other thing i'll say is that it is a fictionalized depiction so the reality of how this technology works um in particular the one that i was interested in is called predpol um which is short for predictive policing but it's one company um, that uses geographic location in order to predict where a crime might take place and the police have something that looks kind of like a google map with different squares where a crime is supposedly going to happen and then they use that to sort of look for potential crimes but also kind of thinking about how having that designa designated location kind of creates criminality um, because whoever's sort of in that box at that time is then a suspect. Before taking um, questions from the audience, um, I thought that we could have a little bit of a conversation amongst ourselves around some of our shared interest, um, but also for the audience to know, um, in some ways, um, both Simone and American artists have engaged each other um, beforehand. And so I thought it would be a unique opportunity for us to also just be participants or observers in your own conversation and the conversations that happen uh, across their work. So um, I have a few questions to kind of jumpstart that exchange. We'll see where it goes and then we'll open it up to questions um, from the floor. I guess, Simone, my first question would be for you, uh, which was that your book, Dark Matters, uh, on surveillance of Blackness has really transformed the study of visual and material culture. And I think foregrounded important questions around Blackness and surveillance. Um, it has been almost eight years since the book's publication. Um, for you, what has most surprised you about the book's reception of the work, um, the reception of the book? 
eight years. Sorry. <laughs> almost, almost. almost. I, yeah, I'm counting. Um, what has been uh, surprising to me about the book's reception? What, what, what has been exciting to me, I think, about okay. the book's reception is, you know, to meet and to be in conversation and to learn from um, uh, people like American um, who um, just to look at that structure and imagine something that I couldn't um, put into form and I and I couldn't put into language um, what I was about about the Cartesian logics and the illogics that uh, American um, was discussing because it, it misses something about the ways in which black folks have resisted capture and uh, and continue to do that and challenge um, the very kind of dynamics of surveillance. So that has been really um, uh, the exciting uh, thing for me um, in terms of the work. I, I'm surprised, what's most surprising is it has been eight years. Like, sure. And when you asked that, I just had to do a count on my, well, maybe the pandemic years don't count, sure. but um, <laughs> it's, it's a, a, a slow. So that has been, um, you know, really exciting um, and that I've been able to, 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 to be in conversation with folks um, at, from high school uh, and on, so. And I was just gonna ask you, American, in this presentation, you really do highlight how you really actively engage with Simone's book, but I guess as a, a question for you is like, what did, I mean, it's a text, it's written word, and your practice is not written word. Um, what did the text itself allow you to think about and then try to articulate in your practice? That's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I think as as someone has, that's done a little bit of writing, not extensively, but I have found often the sort of limitation between what's possible and either. Um, but I think there is a sort of like visceral affect, especially when reading Simone's work, that um, is really what kind of like draws me into it, but sort of trying to find a visual form to like convey the weight of what's going on. Um, and also I was, I was like, like that diagram is so, um, I don't know, like cerebral or something. And then trying to imagine like a third dimension, which you like, that's what you write in the book. Like we're trying to imagine a third dimension and I'm just like, what, like, how do I get there? And so that form was really like, um, it, well, it began as like a cardboard form where I was literally trying to figure out like, how does this work? And then I'm like, I think that, um, desire to find that is is kind of what that piece is trying to be um yeah i don't remember the rest of the question perfect i'm going to stay on you for a moment and i'm mindful that you are a practicing artist and i think in some ways i'd be also interested in hearing how have certain pressures of the art market informed or impacted your engagement with the concept of surveillance That's interesting. I'm. I don't. I don't feel that my engagement with the art market has necessarily shifted my desire to engage with those things. But I would say that, um, like after, so 2019 is when I made um, that B my Blue Window show, as well as the works that were in Simone show, um, which are all like heavily about policing. And during that time, like I was. I was thinking a lot about like the mindset of like a Blue Lives Matter police officer and it was like mentally really like draining, you know, it was like kind of painful to like, like be in that space for so long. And so after that, like I kind of felt a little bit burnt out, like I want to keep talking about these things, but this is like really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like that more so than anything has sort of shifted how I've been approaching my work for the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm 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 trying to figure out how do I still engage with these things and think about their affect or think about doing it in a way that, you know, can show an approach and I'm thinking about sort of like I guess like an abolitionist framework, um but maybe one that's not as as much of a burden on myself and my psyche, you know? So I feel like that has shifted me more than like the market, I would say. And Simone, I just on that point of the art market, I was thinking about art criticism 
And I was just wondering, how does it factor into your own practice of writing about art and engaging with artists? Or is are you doing something completely different? The, que the answer to that is I don't know. Like, I don't know what art criticism is. I'm, I'm a so and I think that's kind of liberating in a sense. I did teach a graduate class once, and there were a lot of art um, a graduate students. I, I didn't really understand some of the language in which they were speaking. Um, uh, that's my own ignorance. But for me, it's I see myself as a student of these artists that I learn from them, whether it is Sandra Perry um, and her use of the various technologies or trying to learn how to etch in ple plexiglass or just you know sitting with american um looking at that piece that was at the queen's museum and seeing it now and well that's a way to think about police vision and how it's so hypnotic and when americans said this is predatory i mean that's what pred poll is it's about the predation of these uh, uh communities and so that i think in the sense that i'm not um, per, and I think that's what Black Studies offers, is that I'm not um, limited to how I can um, think with and learn from and engage with these various, um, you know, intellectual and creative texts mm -hmm. um, that the artists uh, are producing there. But I would like to say, like, to answer that question, that maybe uh, to kind of jump off of Americans' answer, it is exhausting thinking about surveillance, thinking about policing, and the kind of, uh, and, and not necessarily just thinking, writing, talking, being asked to, um, when it's constantly part of our of our daily, um, you know, whether it's videos of police shootings on a daily basis. And I think that, um, that there has to be, the liberation is also about finding spaces of joy and elsewhere. And I'm just so excited to think through, um, you know, a, a, a way otherwise that is abolitionist, mm -hmm. but it still does not only focus on um, uh, how to counter these policing technologies. It's so interesting, too, going back to the first question, thinking about the text and the spatial. You know, some things are only able to be expressed uh, as related to this topic in the spatial or the art construction, and the text is another way about animating or expressing another dimension of the surveillance experience. And so um, in both of your comments now, I'm reminded about how we the art market amplifies. I'm thinking about how the white cube could amplify the violence of the surveillance more than being a space to kind of resolve it or engage with it mm -hmm. critically, just as you're saying with the art criticism as well, not being a part of the project necessarily, but trying to see something else or through it. Mm -hmm. And I guess you all have been in conversation a number of times, but I want it before opening it up to the floor, just to invite you to ask each other a question. I mean, this is the kind of the first time you are seeing each other's presentations here in the context of the BGC, but mm -hmm. also you're revisiting each other's work and your longstanding engagement. So I just wanted to give you all space to do that as well. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Well, I have so many questions. I, I like. I still want to know about the Black Gooey universe. Um, uh, I think maybe my first question is that I know that you had spent some time with Octavia Butler's archive, um, and I want to know how it's continuing to shape your what you're doing. Totally. Yeah. I. Yeah, I'm, so I'm doing this sort of long-term project about Octavia E. Butler, and she was born and raised in the same place as myself, and that's been part of part of my um, entry into what what she was doing. But also, I'm really learning a lot about like art process by reading how she talks about writing process. I think that's been maybe the most one of the more surprising things. Like I didn't expect to learn so much about how to work and how, also how to approach um, a lot of these violent and systemic things um, that she was very aware of and was like very critical of and sort of didn't back down on either. Um, but I think, I don't know, one of, one of the things that was really surprising to me, which um, the the previous manager of the collection um, had showed it to me, but it was like this hand-drawn map that she made, I think it was for um, for Mind of My Mind, where it's sort of like a map of the town. And it's like, it's like first it's like a hand-drawn map of like Altadena, California, like where we both lived, but then it's also handwritten onto the streets or like the names of the streets from the novel. So it's like, 
it's literally like paralleling, you know, the reality and like the fictive environment that she's imagining. And so, I don't know, I thought that was like really, really like salient point for what I was like sort of trying to find. And why agave? Why agave? Yeah, so, so this recent piece that I did that has this agave plant at the base of it, um, drawing that from her novel Parable of the Sower, like, I mean, and very much like agave is kind of this central iconography of Southern Californian, you know, landscape. Um, and also if you visit her archives at the Huntington Library, there's all these agave as well. Um, but at the end of Parable of the Sower, um, the Earthseed community sort of builds this commune and it's protected by these giant agave that it's sort of a natural form of protection. It's almost like a wall. Yeah, so my question, um, which I think comes from like, like teaching your work and thinking about it with students um, and this notion of um, critical biometric consciousness, um, where it's basically like, how do we think about countering um, biometric like data surveillance, I guess, in like practical ways. And I, and I'm wondering like, you know, since the book came out, like how's your, how's your thinking around this shifted and how are you thinking about it in the current moment? So when I was thinking through that concept, it was a, a bit over maybe 10, 15 years ago, where I, where I was thinking about biometrics is how the state uses it to cross borders on passports and whatnot. But if like if I look now, I have all of these things on me, right? And I because I need to know my resting heart rate, my high heart rate variability in the nighttime, all of this stuff. And the part and, and we use biometrics, um, whether it is pulse oximeters, because we're trying to check our oxygen level, or to open our phone or Instagram or Snapchat filters. Those are still like so I guess the answer is it's the control is or we have to think about what these private companies, what's who's sharing our data still, and to have an understanding of our rights to ownership around this data. So I think those have still um, uh, been the same. But for myself, I don't think I've given up, but I've seen that for many, it's, it's a necessity and it's a convenience. And I'll give an example. Like one thing I never thought I would have is, it, I don't even own it, a ring camera. Inside my home, inside my parents' home, I have it so that I could see them in case somebody falls, in case something happens. And it, I, I, it probably won't be me, but maybe there might be a, a time when I, I might need something like that. So the question about that is, okay, well, who has access to this data? Amazon has it on its storage. Um, they have all the sound, they have everything, voice biometrics, all of those things. And so those technologies are necessary and helpful and care for some, but maybe we still should think about um, how this something like that could be collectively done or done without uh, Jeff Bezos or whoever, um, because they are so the so those are questions I still have a question of like who, what are our rights to our data when it's made into some company's intellectual property? Um, can we have a right of refusal or removal? Um, and also have a kind of understanding of its like historical um, antecedents. Like what are the precursors to this kind of surveillance technology? I think all those questions remain, but now I kind of see like, okay, I, I do kind of need to know if I am having blood clots in the nighttime, you know what I mean? And so I, sometimes I have these things, yeah. Great, thank mm -hmm. you. So we are happy to take some questions um, from the audience. We'll take a few. Um, please go ahead, Josh. Um, thank you so much. Um, um, can you wait just for the microphone? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I read uh, your writing in uh, Drew's undergrad freshman year class in uh, the Radio Africa class. It was great. And I want to ask uh, both kind of both your practices um, in this kind of evolving understanding of like AI technology, which kind of like eliminates this idea of like a human person we can kind of assign like knowledge or uh, this kind of knowledge that comes out of nowhere. How do we start to kind of assign responsibility, um, you know, thinking about cameras that were once considered these very objective um, instruments for understanding and uh, knowledge. But now we understand that people behind them, we can hold them responsible, how this will evolve with the understanding of AI where people can get recognized and we don't necessarily buy who, it's just a technology. That makes sense. 
I was thinking of um, the image. Uh, of, can you tell me the name of the piece again that you uh, showed? Not if I were blue. Or the, the predict the print. Oh, uh, it's called 2015. 2015. And you mentioned that, that it was something at, that happened at, before the advent of predictive policing. And that so the idea to not see this as the future or a future that we have to concede to um, and that we can refuse it now or think of imagine some other way of being, perhaps abolition. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, say, something like uh, chat GPT, like mm -hmm. why do we have to concede that this yeah. is how learning and thinking and sure it might be great for writing recipes in your fridge, but there are other you know, ways. And then I think it might be useful. In that sense. Like, what am I going to do with this stuff in the fridge? But that that. But to say that, that they're not neutral when we think about the way that um, the company used um, work, poorly paid workers in Kenya and other sites to develop this, or the way that now um, uh, Meta and Facebook are going to be are allowed to be a, a lawsuit in terms of the trauma um, faced by content moderators on the continent. So all of those things, if we can, I think if we make those connections to um, the kind of extractive logics. Um, of of this kind of capital, of this kind of AI thinking, which is not independent or artificial or intelligent, um, then we can, you know, um, I think the question, we don't have to concede that this is the future that is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think sort of remaining, remaining critical and sort of considering it as, as you said, something that's not inevitable, I think is sort of looking at who's behind it and how that informs what is even possible within it is becoming a more popular conversation, I would say, in my um, impression. And I think, um, like, for example, I was I was teaching class and I was showing my students Mid Journey, which is like the AI image generation. And like, um, quickly within using that, they were like trying to find the sort of limitations on how it would render things or like exposing the biases within it. Like if you put in this specific prompt to render this type of person, is it even capable? And I think having a sort of understanding that these things are inherently biased and inherently um, meant to serve a particular vision of what the future can look like, I think that then it's possible to sort of like remain, you know, keep a sort of safe distance from how you engage with something like that. Thank you. There's one in the back here. Yes. Um, in um, her poem, poem, June Jordan says, Who look at me, who see? Uh, is the black artist doing a service or a disservice to the community by? making uh, these assertions uh, public. I, I don't know. I think maybe both. I mean, I guess it goes back to this notion of like dark surveillance and like, um, if like if you sort of expose what's being done, like the work that's being done, does that undermine the work? And I think it can, but it can also be used to inform. I think there's a lot of a lot of artists that, you know, wouldn't know about the work that I was doing if I didn't talk about it at the same time. So I think it's it's not a it's not a black and white answer. I was just going to say what I do find striking about your collaboration, American artists and Simone, and other contemporary artists' engagement with your work is that it has. I'm thinking here about Kopwani Kiwanga, and Off the Grid that was just at the New Museum. I'm thinking about the work that you had featured in your own exhibition that it has opened up a space. I think for another type of conversation about the Black experience in ways that were not possible before. And I think it is that possibility that is important as we think about, um, which was a question that I had for you jumping off of this question that was just held is like, I mean, in your both your opinions, like what can we learn then th from material culture by looking at it through the lens 
of blackness or surveillance, right? I'm fully aware of the violence um, and the historical experience associated with surveillance, but it also strikes me that we are in this space that studies the decorative arts, design, history, and material culture and trying to set new possibilities forward. I guess jumping off this question, I would ask you all to, you know, just provide some riffs or random thoughts about now taking those as starting points, blackness and surveillance through your own engagement. What is to be learned about material culture in that through them? Those lenses. Well, I, I think to kind of get to the the uh, June Jordan who look at me question, yeah. and also um, what you've raised here is that sometimes artists, folks, workers, laborers, activists are speaking on two different registers and some things could be, or different registers, mm -hmm. uh, could be said and still secrets can remain unheard mm -hmm. um, in, in many ways. So it's not that all is exposed, okay. but what is shared is, uh, you know, decided upon. And I think of um, the, the moment takeover that you did looting, uh, at loot, yeah, at, at that time, um, of, of, of redaction exposure and also critiquing the very sites of these kinds of display. I don't know if everybody here knows about looting, if you want to talk a bit about it. So, yeah, so this was during, this was in 2020, sort of like around the time of the protests in response to the murder of George Floyd. And um, at that time, because of COVID, the museum was not physically open. It was, it, it was closed. And then in anticipation of the riots, they boarded it up. Um, and I was sort of, Thinking about it, what thinking about what it meant for them to anticipate um, people entering the museum. What were they protecting? Were they protecting the work? Do they even own the work? Um, what does it mean for something to be looted? Like, what if everything from the museum got looted? Which was actually a fun question for me. <laughs> um, and I had been asked to do this online work, and so um, for this, their like sunrise sunset series and. So if you go, would go on the website during that time, um, the website would turn black. All of the images of the art would be redacted with this like boarded up image. And so they have like a, their collection online that you can reference, but if you would look through it, it would all be gone. And this is the MoMA website. Not, sorry, not MoMA, Whitney. 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 Whitney yeah. yeah. And any thoughts about this kind of question about? Yeah, I think. To your question, I was I was thinking about. Um, I think I think the perspective one might have towards technologies, um, specifically technologies of capture, as a black person, is like a sort of um, be, like starting from the place of like this is not for me. This is against me and how do I have a sort of like safe perspective of um I don't know concern or, or caution around this you know it's like I'm not just gonna dive into chat GPT I want to know about it and know like first how is it going to take away from me before I engage with it and I I don't know I think that's kind of something I would say um one might have and and when you mentioned that it made me think of the story of the space traders which I've been reading with my students um from Derek bell which is like this short story of these aliens they come to america and they're like we're gonna solve all your problems we're gonna give you gold oil and fix the environment you just have to give us every black person and then like the president and the cabinet are deliberating like should we do it should we not do it um, they don't know what's going to happen to everyone who's black. Um, and yeah, I'll let you read the story. Other questions? Okay. Well, you've given us a lot to think about. Was there anyone? Okay. Well, you've given us a lot to think about. So are we just, maybe we can give them a round of applause. Thank you.